Uh, once again, let me welcome everyone to our webinar on putting emerging and proven innovations to work, Insights from the Public Sector for the Future Summit. Today is co-sponsored by the Leadership for a Networked World Program and the Government Innovators Network at Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Our speaker is Antonio Ostoli, a fellow at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and Executive Director of the Leadership for a Networked World Program. And we'll be starting us off today. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a moderately cold and rainy day here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that means it's a really good day for learning and talking with some of our peers. Uh, some important work to do today. Um, many of you, uh, all of you for the most part, uh, are facing difficult challenges in government, trying to figure out how we deliver better outcomes for the future. One of the ways Harvard is trying to contribute to helping you do this is through our Public Sector for the Future Summit, where we bring together leading practitioners like you, faculty from across Harvard, uh, along with thought leadership from Accenture and program support, to look at defining what the future of the public sector looks like. Uh, this program is not about politics or about big government or small government, but it's about when society decides what government should be working on, how do we get, get better outcomes from that work, do it effectively and efficiently. The panel today will have Nicholas O'Brien from New York City, Logan from, from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and Perry Sabbath from Exeter. But before we get into their presentations on the innovations they're looking at, I'll give you a little bit of context on what's happening in the United States, but also around the world, went to uh, publics for the future. So first, wicked situation. We often use this term, uh, especially in the Northeast United States, for situations where there are a lot of factors coming together that are difficult to solve. Heart drop is that there's a, a need for new capacity and economic growth in the United States and around the world, but all punctuated by very difficult public deficits, a lot of technological disruption and convergence, and major demographic changes. As the United States and with our coalition partners, we're grappling a nearly 15-year war that lost an estimated $4 trillion over our lifetime. So we have a hole, so to say, to dig out of. We're in massive technological change with uh, ICT and the Internet of Things, big data and analytics changing the way that our work is structured. Lounges in the world are cross-boundary in nature, meaning that they touch multiple domains and we have to figure out how to work on those together in new ways. We're trying to figure out how to harmonize effectiveness and efficiency. Sometimes trade offs on how effective government can be and how efficient they can be. What can we do to make that harmonize in a better way? So society and constituents, citizens are really demanding outcomes like no time ever before. In the States, we've seen this from our latest elections, where people are saying we need government to do more with less and get better outcomes for our dollars. What's the answer to this? Well, there's a little backdrop in the private sector, and some of you on our call today are from the private sector. In times change like this, established firms look at new business models. They don't address new business models and do things differently. What happens is they face an erosion of their market share. In the private sector, at least, there's a good imperative for forming their organizations over time. In the public or the social sector, we have a lot of established institutions that have been doing business in the same way for a long period of time. But there are a lot of new business models coming forward, which our panelists will talk about. Present new ways to either build capacity and value or to own capacity and value if they're not responded to in a good way. So, the public sector, for you leaders on the line today, what is really important is this legitimacy imperative, and that society will judge you based on how well you transform your organizations over time to meet demands of the future. Looking at this as far as public sector for the future summit, well, there's two ways that you can look at this. Type of way. And as leaders uh, like you uh, grab these issues, the innovation management side. So, you can look at incremental innovations to existing value propositions, how your organization currently is designed, what you're currently uh, looking for your mission, change your operating model in order to maintain or improve efficiency and effectiveness. This is good work. Uh, it, 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 it may not operate uh, much better over the long term. But also, the second dimension, which is transformational leadership. And what we're 
what we're is really how do we change the value proposition of government over time and of your agency over time to achieve entirely new levels of capacity and outcomes. So what we're really trying to do with the Public Sector of the Future Summit is bring leaders like you every year to say, what are we going to do to drive innovation in our government organizations and what are we going to do to look at transformation and delivering completely new ways to drive the value. And framing that at the summit and on this call is the uptake and edge matrix. But what this matrix helps us to think about is if there's an issue coming forward, uh, whether it's a, a new innovation or something that we're uh, that's a staff trying to drive forward, the can plot these on this matrix. So the access looks at measuring the sophistication of your new operating model. The Y looks at how pervasive it is, meaning that maybe you have a few pilot programs. But you split up and, and it becomes embedded across your organization and enterprise. And the types of innovations. So, uptake innovations are relatively proven operating models, such as shared services, that solid leadership to move forward, but take a lot of work. And innovations on the edge, which are operating models that haven't yet proven their full value, things like uh, ad based budgeting, for example. Yet they're poised to really transform government over time. The key is we looked at at the Public Sector for the Future Summit are fourfold. Evidence-based organizations, where we customize the enterprise, citizen-centric service, and the agile workforce. And I'll briefly touch base on these four before it's over to uh, Nicholas O'Brien in New York City. On the evidence-based organization side, people at the set said, essentially we have to figure out how smart can our policies and programs become. To get that level of smart, quote unquote, by looking at data and analytics and the intelligence that can give us over time. So on the far left of the spectrum, uptake innovation, submit some of the basic things. I think you guys are doing well already. You're tracking inputs and outputs and basic performance metrics. And as you move all the way to the right, you're looking at harnessing evidence-based budgeting and predictive analytics to do, uh, to look at a real insight and wide insight into your organizations, and that's what we call the evidence-based organization. The story is the eyes of the enterprise. Instead, we're asking how efficient and effective can we make our government. On the innovation side, some of the simple things around consolidating common systems and services, most of you guys are working on now, moving into collaborating and sharing across boundaries and jurisdictional lines, and doing a, a, a portfolio approach to shared services, looking at partner across jurisdictions but also across sectors on key acts of government business. Category is citizen-centric service. Here, how open and connected can we make our policies and programs to our constituents and citizens? Once again, on the uptake side, by putting our legacy and silo-based information into usable public data, the way to the right where we say, how can we work with citizens to partner on designing and building and delivering services from scratch? And the last one is the agile workforce. I'm that to have an intelligent uh, business and one that's uh, connecting with citizens in good ways and optimized enterprise, our workforce has to match with capabilities. So the here is how do we adapt the skills and composition and structure of our workforce to meet demands of an increasingly complex world. Purchase at the summit essentially said, one is we have to be really good on the uptake side of looking at what is our baseline. We all know we're facing challenges with states of what we call the silver tsunami with the coming retirements and replacing those workers. We better create and educating to specialized knowledge centers across employee bases and enabling cross-agency knowledge and employee mobility, things very few governments are able to do yet when we're all looking to try and accomplish. So these categories are uh, make the uptake and edge matrix. Our panelists today, uh, Nicholas O'Brien and Kelly Logan and Perry Sabby, will talk about these in the context of their organizations and their experience to show how to move from uptake innovations to edge innovations, how to get more capacity from your government, and how to get and develop the government of the future. With that, I will turn it over to Nicholas O'Brien from New York City, who will give some insight into his work there. Nicholas. Excuse me, this is Jessica from Ash Center. Nicholas is not connected to our phone call yet, um, so I think we should move on. Okay, we'll, uh, we will start next with uh, Kelvin. 
Jackson from Wilson, Pennsylvania. Kelly. Hello, good afternoon. Um, you would like to advance the slides or I will do that from here. How? John uh, while well, the system catches up with me. Okay. Really? Okay. Can you uh, click on the right drop down uh, next to the off the slide and uh, your slides up again? I'm sorry. That's quite all right. Thank you. Oops. That's You can. You want to take it yeah. over from now? One moment. Right well, over from us is MIT, and you know, we can bring some people from uh, MIT to come over and help. But we usually. Don't. <laughs> well, thank you. I see that that my slide, my first slide, is up, and so I appreciate this uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing here in the Commonwealth of. Pennsylvania where when it comes to predictive government and uh, looking at our workforce of the future. So just a, a quick agenda slide. I'll talk a little bit about uh, our workforce overview and the trends we're seeing here for our workforce in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and talk a little bit about our uptake initiatives, our edge initiatives which are affecting our workforce and talk about some of our workforce planning tools, our workforce development programs. Uh, so as you take a look at what we look like here in state government in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have 36 agencies, boards and commissions under the governor's jurisdiction and uh, a little more than 72,000 full-time employees. 82% of our employees are represented by one of 20 unions that we have here. AFSCME is our largest union in Pennsylvania. In addition to that, 69%, uh, nearly 70% of our employees are merit covered or civil service employees. We have a population here in Pennsylvania of 12.8 million citizens. And so when you look at our ratio of citizens served to state government employees, we have the lowest, the eighth lowest number of employees serving of the number of citizens we have when you look at us compared to other states. If you look at uh, both full-time and part-time employees in the Commonwealth, we've seen dramatic reductions in our workforce over uh, the last 10 years and uh, significantly over the last four years since our governor came into office, we've seen some real reductions in workforce. We've been able to do this though through adding additional efficiency to the work and the way we do our work, but also uh, implementation of technology initiatives that I'll talk a little bit about in, in the next few slides. Uh, also looking, although we have reduced our number of employees significantly, we continue to see escalating costs in um, not only salary, but the benefits portion of what we pay for each employee. So you can see salary, we've got about an average salary for our employees in state government that are on par with the average employees, uh, average citizens. We then have some significant pension challenges here in Pennsylvania, and you see those costs escalating over the next few years. And obviously, health care is also a, a significant cost for our employees. Antonio talked a little bit about the silver tsunami, and, and we'll talk about that over the next couple of slides here. We really are seeing shifts in um, the age of our workforce. Uh, looking at 2006 compared to Shear, a significant reduction, nearly 20,000 fewer baby boomers in our workforce, in our state government workforce. And you can see here the growth of our Generation X and Generation Y employees. The other thing that we're seeing is that as employees come to work for us in state government, they are staying a fewer number of years. Uh, right now we have uh, just over uh, nearly 8,000 employees that have more than 25 years of service 
Here in Pennsylvania, when you reach 25 years of state government service, you are eligible for lifetime health care. So that drives some of that uh, from leaving at that age. Here's a, a slide kind of looking at the projections we have around that silver tsunami. So today, 11,000 of our employees can walk out the door. They have reached uh, retirement age, and each year uh, in out years, we see adding to that by uh, more than 3,000 employees each year. What this chart shows is our annual separation rate. And as you can see, it, it moves around a bit. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've had nearly 4,000 employees retire. Um, then obviously we have separations from just resignations and uh, we've had some furloughs you can see there and some other reasons for leaving. What we anticipate seeing in this next calendar year is the significant uptake uh, in retirements. As you can see from this chart, those get the, that increases dramatically in years where we have a new collective bargaining agreement with our largest union. And also when you see a change in administration, and uh, um, Antonio mentioned the changes that have happened across the country just over the last few days, and we will be getting a new governor in Pennsylvania in January of this year. So those will both affect separation rates. When you are our workforce eligibility for retirement, I mentioned this, 11% uh, of our folks have 25 years of service, 16% of them have reached retirement age, and as we look at years in 2018, we expect 32% of them to have reached retirement age. Just a couple of slides on some of our uptake and edge initiatives. Uh, Antonio mentioned HR services. We have we run an enterprise resource planning package here, SAP. We implemented that in the late 90s, uh, and it is an enterprise approach for all of our data. We then built on that, and we have have an, an HR Shared Service Center, which launched in 2010. So we consolidated all of those high transaction HR processes in a central location. We've seen a lot of benefit from that. We offer employee and supervisor self-service. We're seeing much more consistent and accurate services delivered and have been able to reduce the number of people that need to serve our employees by 78 positions, and we're saving over $3 million annually as a result of that. Again, built on that uptake uh, initiative, and we have launched uh, two years ago a new onboarding for our new employees where from the comfort of their own home, they can go through that orientation process they can, with their significant other, make choices on their health care or on their uh, benefits in consultation with them. And it's actually freed up our staff uh, to perform some other HR functions that you need to be face to face with. So we're saving another million dollars annually from uh, adding that initiative. One of the initiatives uh, that Governor uh, started when he came in was the Governor's Innovation Office here in Pennsylvania, and we have driven more nearly $700 million in savings through uh, innovation initiatives. When this was set up, and it is a best practice, the Governor issued an executive order and made it very clear where we were going with innovation and the responsibilities of the leaders of all of our agencies. Agencies. We set up appropriate governance around that, including a, a governing board that ensures that the initiatives that we have go forward are staying on process and we're, we're documenting that savings. And you can go to our website to, to see more detail there. E-government really is somewhere that we have focused as well. Moving to this responsive design so that whether you're at your desktop or you're at on your handheld device or your iPad, our websites and services respond to the size of the screen so that it's easy to see, easy to transact business on either your desktop or your handheld device. We're also implementing a number of online services and applications, really trying to drive away from the high cost 
you know, our citizens have to drive into a location, stand in line to get their services. So moving from having them have to stand in line to letting them go online from the comfort of wherever they want to be to do business with state government. Another uh, really edge initiative that we have going on, uh, we are the first state in the country that will move to this compute on demand um, file for our databases, for our, our major data centers. We are moving to central data centers and five agency data centers to the cloud. We've contracted with a vendor who will deliver those services for us, and we will only pay for the amount of consumption we need. So like an electric power plant, there's no reason that we need to own a power plant. We just want to turn on our lights and pay when we have our lights on. It's the same concept with this uh, consumption on demand from our data centers. Just slides on our workforce planning tools. We have several tools that are available that you can go online and take a look at where we use this information on the numbers of employees we have and the trending we've seen with our employees. We also have internal tools that our managers and leaders in organizations use. Um, one of them is this mobility tool. We, we ask trends and exit and transfer survey questions. Why did you want to come and work in state government? Why did you want to move from one job to another? And why are you separating? So that we can make changes to our programs to adjust for that. Uh, just an example of our manager's dashboard. They can do workforce planning. They can see the age of their employees. They can see their vacancies. They can see the diversity within their workforce. This retirement planning tool allows for proactive planning and looking at who can retire in the next four years. They take that information and we can chart what it looks like presently, who can retire today who's coming up within one year, two years, four years, and then develop a plan for developing our internal folks to move up into leadership positions. Um, last section I'm going to cover is that workforce of the future. A little bit about our EDGE initiative with consolidating our data centers. And just as an example, we're looking at our IT workforce of the future. If we don't need our folks, because we won't need our folks managing boxes and servers, we are looking at what workforce impacts that has. We've put, it is a strategic initiative for us. We've put governance in place. We're looking at those IT functions with IT strategy in mind, look at job classifications, and look at the classifications we need in the future. Um, look, at those classifications will include contract management, uh, capacity planning, which are some different functions than we have today. And then we're identifying those training needs so that we can transition current staff from positions that they have now to these new classifications. Just a couple, uh, listing a few of our workforce development initiatives that we use. But targeted recruitment programs and internship opportunities where we can really design and have designed our program around the types of employees we need for the types of work we have going forward. Uh, and my last slide on this is some of the new approaches we're using are these partnership approaches with post-secondary institutions, our colleges and universities. So when we look at e-government and developing online apps and services, we're engaging the students who are currently enrolled in colleges and setting up mobile PA challenges so they can take our data and develop applications that then can be used by our citizens and businesses. Um, it's been a nice tool for them to learn what we do. It's been a nice opportunity for us to do some recruitment through these programs. Uh, and we have a number of professional development programs that we're leveraging as we're making these strategic moves with technology. And this uh, just shows you a list of a few of those. With that, um, you, anything you would like to take a look at, I have a number of websites 
metrics that I've listed that we have, but we also try to keep our employees up to date on all new things that we're doing through our Facebook page, which is available to anyone. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Antonio. Thank you. Wonderful work you're doing there in Pennsylvania. We're going to turn next to Nicholas O'Brien, who's going to give us some ideas on uh, efforts taking place in New York City around uptake and edge and transforming services there. Nicholas. Great. Ken. Sure, Ken. Great. Uh, so, uh, Kelly, thanks for that. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of parallels to what Pennsylvania is working on and New York City is working on, looking at Antonio's various um, uh, spectrums there around optimized enterprise, agile workforce, evidence-based organization, and citizen-centric service. Uh, New York City is certainly doing a lot of those things in terms of data center consolidation, looking into cloud services, our, our dashboard offerings both to the public and to internal executives, uh, looking at human-centered design, and, and we do have a Office of Workforce Development. So I think that would be a, an entire presentation on itself and the activity we have in that area. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I think we're probably at the first or second node of any of those spectrums. Uh, but I'm going to uh, today talk specifically about what my office does. Uh, I work in the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, which uh, we're a civic intelligence center, and uh, we aggregate and analyze data from across city agencies to address a range of different uh, issues that face the city, crime, public safety, quality of life. Um, and typical projects, which I'll get into, are prioritize, uh, prioritize triage uh, inspections, uh, optimize services, and, and uh, targeted enforcement. Um, and then also, we've more recently moved into transparency. So, uh, moving on to the next slide. I don't know if I have a. There we go. So, when we started, you know, it really was um, what I would say uh, it was an edge innovation. There wasn't Written really many uh, organizations around the city doing it. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we hired a bunch of people right out of undergrad. We had the standard issue technology that most uh, city employees get, old PCs and, and Excel. Um, and nobody really knew what we were up to. You know, we were still learning, so we didn't fully know what we were up to. Um, but we had good data, and a lot of that was due to the investments that New York City has made over time uh, to modernize their systems. We had solid support uh, from the executive, and sitting in the mayor's office was a really key piece to this to work on some of the interagency stuff that we've been working on. Uh, we had great clients, and uh, we, we treat all our agencies as clients, and that was a, a sort of learning curve that we had to go on, which I'll also discuss uh, in a little bit. Um, and we focused on client-driven, pragmatic, actionable insight. And I think this is the, the client-driven and actionable are very important here because we didn't want to be a solution in search of a problem. We didn't want to say, hey, look at these cool toys we have. Look at these cool things we can do with data. How can we make your lives easier? Um, we wanted to find people who had problems to solve and work with them on solving them, um, particularly by using data, because we're not going to figure out how to reinvent their operation. I think that they're subject matter experts, and we're never going to get to that space. So very Early on in the beginning, um, I like to call it, uh, it was our, our first project and our initial failure, but it did lay the foundation for success. So it was focused on financial crime. And the idea was that data analysis could replace the traditional law enforcement approach of getting tips, leads, um, understanding a sort of network of bad actors. We wanted to do data mining to find patterns, and we focused on mortgage fraud in New York City. So we looked at all the property records, the transfers, and looked for strange things like a, zero, a series of zero-dollar transfers between different entities or a an eventually growing uh, value of a property or a short period of time, which seemed strange. So we, we pulled these out of the city property records, and we gave them over to the DAs, and we did this for six months, and we got a single indictment. And talking to the DAs, we figured out the reason they didn't really want to go after these is because they didn't see a victim. A lot of victims ended up being banks. Banks were ready to write it off as a cost of doing business. And so we didn't really have a problem that we were facing. Um, but in the process of this initial failure, we did gain a deep understanding of the data that New York City has on its locations and businesses operating in the locations and the owners. The, I think one of the most important things that we pulled out of that was that we understood we needed to have a client with a problem to solve. Having a client with a problem to solve 
solves a whole bunch of different challenges that uh, analytics organizations face. You get attention to your project, you can get action coming out of it, um, and you get resources towards it because it already has been identified as a problem uh, by executives. And then also, I think you know where to look and ask questions of the data when you have a framework to operate in and a problem to solve. If you get a big data dump, there's a ton of things you can do with it, and without some sort of framework, Work to understand what questions you're trying to answer, you can sort of poke around for a long time without really getting uh, any progress. So after, after we failed on this initial one, we took what we knew um, and we applied to a, a problem that was emerging in New York City. So in 2011, we had a series of fires in illegally converted apartments. Now, if you've been to New York, you may know we have a permanent housing crisis here. Our vacancy rate hovers around sub 1% um, at all times. And so there's a huge incentive for people to cram folks into uh, spaces, take a two bedroom, cut it up into a five bedroom, take a, um, a basement or an attic, convert it into a residential unit, take a commercial space and convert it into a residential unit. Uh, and these places are dangerous. And it really came to a head with these two fires where five people died in the span of a couple months over the, the summer in 2011. We looked at um, two of them and for the fingerprints that they left in city data. And we found a couple things um, that come between them that we believe we could pull that pattern out and find other locations like this that were risky and were at risk of fire and, and at risk of dangerous fire. One of them was a high-risk neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that experienced a lot of fires historically. 1938 construction. In 1938, the building codes were changed in New York City, so older buildings don't have a lot of the modern safety amenities that the newer buildings do. Uh, the property has pendants on it in New York State that's a mortgage foreclosure start, or if the property had a tax lien. Both of these indicated that the owner was in financial distress and that uh, there's a good chance that they would be looking for ways to squeeze more money out of their property. And if had a complaint through the 311 system, uh, which was very strongly correlated uh, with uh, additional fire. So all we did was we looked for places that looked like these problem places around the city. Um, we did it based on 311 complaints. So a 311 came in. We get roughly 20,000 of them each year through the 311 system for a little conversions. And uh, we saw if it hit these metrics. And if it did, we tagged it uh, for inspection. Uh, and the results were astounding over the first year. So before we started doing this, a complaint came in, we sent an inspector out, and we were finding a, uh, a vacatable condition, which means the property was so dangerous it had to be emptied in whole or in part. Uh, we were finding that at roughly 13% of the time. Targeting exercise, and this, this trend persisted for a year, uh, we were getting 70% uh, of the locations that we were targeting, uh, we were able to vacate. Um, now, vacate is a bad metric. It's a bad outcome in general. It puts people out on the street. But these places are so dangerous that you know, we could just not we could not allow people to uh, live in them any longer. And the city does provide shelter uh, and pays for that shelter for people who are displaced. And, and we actually did send um, a resource administration along with the Red Cross on these inspections to ensure that there was a little bit of pushback there because uh, the HRA has to bear the cost, the human resource has to bear the cost of housing people. So we wanted to make sure that um, they weren't just sort of going and uh, inspectors going and go trying to push people out and we had a counterbalance there. Um, we're still getting this elevated rate. Uh, now, truth in advertising, the elevated rate was really only for what we would find of the worst of the worst that hit all these metrics. So we were doing roughly uh, 50 to 70 properties. But I think it really shows that if you can find a needle in a haystack if you go looking for it. So we took this approach and we expanded it. Uh, we were able to throw all properties that the fire department has jurisdiction over. And there's a whole bunch of other examples, which uh, I'm not going to go into now because of uh, time constraints, but I'm happy to check on contact information, but he wants to find out about some of the specific projects we've been working on. I'm happy to walk through them, some of the methodologies, techniques, and data that we've used. But I did talk about the areas that we focus on, and, and certainly there are other efforts popping up around New York to focus on health and human services and workforce development, um, which uh, we work very closely with them. But, but 
uh, my area of focus really is in the day-to-day -day operations uh, of our uh, of our agencies: Department of Buildings, Sheriff's Department, Environmental Protection, uh, NYPD, FD. For stuff like targeted enforcement, operations uh, optimization, and we also do a good amount of work in economic development, uh, serving as some of the number of for some of the economic research that the city does. Uh, and then one of our final areas of focus is in disaster response and sustainability. Um, when Hurricane Sandy hit, it became clear that there was a huge amount of disruption that happened in the standard way that the city recorded its activity and uh, processed information coming in. And having the capacity of the Office of Data Analytics available, uh, we were able to synthesize a lot of that data, do reporting on it, capture it, and turn it into something we could make decisions on. Uh, admittedly, the economic development and day-to-day -day operations uh, uh, projects that we were working on had to slow down or stop during that period, uh, but really in, an, in a period of acute need, having this capacity and having folks around in the city who work for the city, you don't have to go out through an RFP process, bring a vendor on uh, to do this kind of work. It was really crucial to getting, uh, getting this capacity stood up very quickly and able to address um, you know, what problems we had uh, immediately facing us. So uh, we have these areas of focus and we're building it out. And, and one of the things we realized was in the early projects, we were really based on ad data transfers. So a, a, uh, if somebody bringing a thumb drive over or uh, emailing a large file, um, a little bit of FTP stuff. So it was, you know, it was very, it, it was an ad hoc kind of thing. It was not a permanent thing. So we went about uh, building a more robust system. And I think the reason we were able to get this funded uh, was because we started small. We started with these immediate projects that we could see a clear problem that the city had, uh, attack them, showed the value of it, and showed some of the problems we had with the ad hoc nature of it. And so we said we need to routinize this. So what you're looking at here is a, a graphic depicting our data warehouse we call Data Bridge. The green circles are city agencies, and the yellow boxes are um, different systems that they run to do different operational processes. Uh, we gather them all together into this Data Bridge system, and we, which is really just a big Oracle warehouse, and we merge them based on location. Um, so information that comes from uh, DP on a particular building merged with housing preservation and development. We're able to bring them all together based on a building level. When we went to start building this, we thought, yeah, we'll do it for buildings, we'll do it for businesses, we'll do it for people. We got about halfway through locations and really um, didn't run a steam, but realized how complex and large this undertaking was. Um, another thing that we learned about this is that, that these are constantly moving around and getting modernized, so it's not like you can just build it. It was, uh, when I was growing up in New York, I kept seeing scaffolding and construction projects, and I thought, well, you know, New York will be done, you know, just, just a few months away, just a few years, and then they'd finish up one project and scaffolding would go up someplace else, or they'd staring up another road, and I said, well, I, I thought it was going to be done. So I came to the unfortunate realization New York will never be done, and, and we're going to constantly build. And I had to learn that lesson for when you're building a large analytics warehouse like this. Um, so for example, DCA, which is off to the bottom right there, that came a system that actually no longer exists. We got done building the system, we modeled it um, with all the other data, and then the came system was retired. We're right now working to bring that back into the system. Them. It's a constant effort to keep this, uh, keep this moving, keep it updated, and the more users and eyes you have on it, the more political capital you have to make sure that the data systems continue to feed into it and that you can mobilize funding uh, to do that kind of work because it's not free to hook these things up, um, and so you have to constantly be delivering value on top of it to justify the maintenance of it. architecture like that built, a lot of things start to fall out of it. They, they become a lot easier to execute and a lot faster, and you can really start to think, move from having just a few projects like that to you know, spinning them off very quickly and making this a standard operating procedure, move more towards that uptake um, end of the spectrum. So two examples, we have a mobile inspection app that we've deployed with our Office of Special Enforcement, where they're able now to see everything that is known about a building and in the neighborhood around it. So they can look for patterns, they can look for networks, they really know what they're walking into now, which 
uh, makes them more effective and safer. And then another one uh, for the Fire Department Operations Center is our building intelligence tool. Uh, it gives firefighters immediate access to critical info. The system we had before was we'd be out to a building and um, some back at headquarters would be looking at the Department of Environmental Protection website, see if there were any hazardous chemical permits, uh, hazardous chemical storage permits for the location, if there have been any bill violations um, that may actually render the structure unstable and dangerous. And uh, we, we have access to all that information, but it took a little while. When a fire truck is, is charging out there, um, you've got about four minutes to get that done, so we were able to reduce that time because we had all this architecture built. And then another thing, which I think also is a topic for uh, a whole other uh, presentation, is we're able to uh, power open data sites. So there's about a dozen different things we've integrated into the warehouse that now we can publish uh, onto the web and really activate the, uh, the civic technology community that we have here in New York. So in the beginning, when we're, we're living on the edge uh, you know, and trying to build this uh, I think center of excellence here in the mayor's office, which was the goal the whole time, we started small. We had small projects that we knew we could execute on. We worked on a lot of different things um, by being nimble and agile. And I think the only reason we're able to do that is because we had access to subject matter experts who really knew their stuff and were willing to work with us. And the reason they were willing to work with us is because they had a problem they were trying to solve. Um, and then also to uh, set realistic um, expectations of what we can do, what we can't do. We get a lot of different types of requests, and, and we've really learned how to articulate what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, um, and what we know we can deliver on, and, and what might be a, a project that requires application development or full-on system integration, which oftentimes is the right answer. Um, but for a team like mine, uh, we want to address it quickly, get it done quickly, deliver using that you can take action on. Um, encouraging collaboration across the traditional silos. Um, I think City Mayor's Office has been really key to this, that we have access to a whole bunch of different um, information across agencies, and this, this design has really worked out very well for us. Um, the development of analytics offices at city agencies um, has been crucial to it, um, and we really worked to hook them up. We really couldn't do our work without them being there, being the subject matter expertise under, experts and understanding the data. Um, and then celebrating, promoting the success. Uh, you know, people want to hear about this stuff. Um, people are interested in how to replicate it, and we want to talk about it. Um, oftentimes, there'll be litigation that we have to wait to complete, but um, things are moving fast, but they don't get stale within a couple, couple months or even a couple years. So um, I think going out there talking about it, um, and, and if anybody wants to get into more details about some of the specific projects we've done, very happy to, to do that. Um, and then to be opportunistic, focus on a problem when it emerges. If you see something that somebody needs to fix, jump right on it, offer a hand. Um, that's how uh, we've been able to actually get our projects implemented. Um, key to that, though, is having the expertise um, and providing value adds because you have to have a base to operate off of. And, that, and starting from scratch, anybody can start from scratch. So we have a good working knowledge of the data, and we have systems to exchange that data. And so we're really starting from, you know, from the 50-yard line trying to get a touchdown instead of starting from, from our own 10-yard uh, line. And I think that's, that's really been crucial, too. Um, and as we move forward, we are, we're working on putting a team in place to increase the uptake of this, uh, of this approach. Um, two of the key folks in the de Blasio administration who are spearheading this are Minerva Tantoka, who's the city's first ever chief technology officer. Um, she's going to be focusing more on building, uh, building the technology backbone that drives this and the uptake processes of, of best practice. And then Dr. Amin Rama Shariki, who is uh, I mean, my boss, who's starting next week. We're really excited to have him coming from the uh, coming from the federal government, and he's going to really be taking some of the this technology framework and applying it to specific problems that agencies have. Um, so that's uh, that's all the slides I have for right now. I'm going to turn it back to Antonio, but just one parting thought is the client focus. Um, on a client that has a problem has really been key to this. You know, we sort of operate um, as a as a sort of attorney-client privilege. We're not going to we're going to tell you that you did anything wrong. We're not going to tell you that you have to do this, have to do that. We want to hear about your problem. We'll give you advice. 
um, using that on how best to address it. And I think that's really been uh, key to our success. There are definitely, uh, there's definitely problems that we can't address that do need that system integration, that application development, change in operational processes. Um, but that's a different side of the house from us. And I think both are really valuable. Um, and we're really trying to figure out how to scale up what we do um, so it can be most effective across New York City. So with that, I want to thank you and turn it back to Antonio. Thanks. Wonderful work there on uptaking edge innovations in New York City. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the call, we will do some Q&A directly after our next panelist, so you can uh, input your questions into the queue box there. We have a number of them already coming in. Uh, you can put them there, we'll stage them as we move forward. Uh, we're going to move, move next to Perry Sabaty. Perry has been the, uh, the director of the state of Ohio and, and a vice president at Antioch University and is now with Accenture Public Service. Perry, can you give us a some bound on uptake and innovations, particularly in Massachusetts. Yeah, um, Antonio, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting to watch, and both Kelly and uh, Nick have referred to this, is how do you move from something on the uptake to something that's on the edge and do so successfully? Uh, so I will be talking today about a case study in Massachusetts, but um, in my past, as as I uh, uh, as built up an ERP at the state of Ohio and then stood up a shared services initiative, it was important to think about the keys to success for how to begin to move from uh, uptake to edge. We often implement big ERP systems and our institutes are so exhausted by doing that, it's extraordinarily hard to get them to focus on how to use those systems to allow them to um, move uh, into the kinds of innovations that everyone has been talking about. So let's, let's think about what it takes to be successful at that. Clearly set a vision, you have governance concerns, pay attention to incentives, Make sure that you're delivering and demonstrating customer satisfaction. All things that we've heard a great deal about already. The case study that I'm going to talk about here, which is not in my home state, Ohio, but is in Massachusetts. Um, this involves an, a work by an integrated facilities management group within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and their doing uh, asset ma management and maintenance. And you can see, I'm going to, you know, why do we care about real estate these days? These are things that you've got to look at, and I, as a budget director, certainly spent a great deal looking at, is where are opportunities we can extract costs and lower the, cost, the back office invisible costs of running government so we can push more resources to the front to sit in facing operations. And rate really is a complicated problem in state government. We've got centralized management and ownership of the facilities. And uh, so that kind of stands in the way of what Antonio would call an optimized enterprise. We've got workforces that are far more mobile. We've got caseworkers that are working on iPads and often don't need their own office at the Department of Human Services. They could hotel or do some other things. So we've got a workforce that is becoming more agile. Uh, we, have, we have technology that doesn't allow us to analyze what's happening to our estate across the entire enterprise to allow us to track problems, uh, do preventive maintenance, um, actually use evidence to make decisions across the enterprise around how we are investing our assets. And and um, in this case study, you will see the glimmers of how what the state of Massachusetts has been able to do. Uh, we have addressed much of that. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Governor Deval Patrick, about two um, years into his last term, uh, implemented an executive order that directed DCAM, the uh, Capital Asset Management Division, to uh, to implement integrated uh, facilities management across the entire state. 
a lot of assets, 80 million square feet of assets, 1,600 separate structures, 276 campuses, 30,000 real estate parcels, and overall budget across the entire state commonwealth of five to six million dollars a year for facilities maintenance. It's a big job. One of the things that was important to do, and I'm not going to read this slide, so you can take a look at that small print, but think about where uh, the Commonwealth was and where it wanted to go, right? Our first key to success is to set a vision. And where the agency was was solid agencies, uh, inconsistent budgeting, inadequate deferred maintenance, inconsistent levels of service. Ad hoc decision making. And what they really wanted to move through to was an integrated facility management capability that would centralize finance. Deferred maintenance would become a priority in each agency's budget. Boast of a customer focused culture, structured governance framework, and a strong professional development program. And you can see in those Parts of the vision, much of what we've talked about in terms of organizations of the future on the edge and what should be focused on. So it was very important, and I think a key success factor around here was to not just set a vision, but also address the culture of the organization. And leadership was extraordinarily uh, focused on how to begin to get every employee in this vastly fragmented enterprise to think in similar ways about how to approach what they were doing every day, the decisions they were making every day. And so they adopted this 4E framework, which focused on four aspects of real estate operations. How effective are we? How efficiently are we operating? Are dealing with environmental issues in a way that we want to, reducing our environmental footprint and uh, reducing our energy usage? Are we engaging uh, appropriately and at the right level with our customers, which was extraordinarily important to transforming the culture itself? So there were aspects of the uh, initiative that really helped Massachusetts build this, rebuild this enterprise transformation uh, very well. I talked a bit about what leadership did around culture. I want to address myself to two things on this slide. First of all, communication. One of the ways in which they really worked hard at, at how to broadcast to audiences all over the state what they were doing with this long-term plan is they put together a blueprint. You can actually go online and Google this blueprint. You'll see it out there, which lays out a multi-year agenda transformation of the real estate enterprise for the state. And it was very interesting about how Massachusetts did this initiative was the little box at the bottom of the screen, financial planning. What they did was they actually took a look at the chargeback model and referred to how you design incentives in such a way that you are changing the behavior of everyone participating in the organization. They took a look at the chargeback methods and realized that they made some basic changes to the way in which services were charged back, that they, as the agency, Optimizing the organization and member agencies would put on the same side of the table. So one of the most innovative things they did was to, to totally transform their chargeback model. All have government where agencies own their own buildings, and some of those buildings owned by agencies are 50% vacant, right? Um, and so what they did to, to uh, deal with that issue was they had um, all 
agencies charged instead of based upon the square footage they owned, charged based on the square footage they actually used. And then it was up to the central agency to figure out what agencies and what expanding functions they could take out a leased space and use to fill up that vacant space throughout the enterprise, thus really beginning to focus on how to be much more optimized across the entire state and to really change the way all the actors began to think about how they used space. So uh, one way they reorganized was to look at regions within the state of Massachusetts. So they divided the state into five regions. The very important part of any one of these transformations is how do you stay close to the customer and deliver high quality services. Um, and this regional framework is really what anim animated their customer centric model to really think about how they were delivering services on the ground in a much uh, higher quality and more consistent way. And one of the places they paid a great deal of attention to was governance. How to make sure that when you unify this immensely fragmented organization across multiple levels of government, how are you making sure that you're making right decisions the right level and not above that level, and how are you making sure that you're, you are making decisions at the top level that create the right incentives throughout the enterprise. This governance plan that they put together very intentionally assigns decisions inside this very complex multi-agency organization based on three things. Important is the decision. How significant is it? How much does it cost? How how the duration of the contract? What's the square footage? You know, how material is it? And what's the degree of impact it's going to have across the Commonwealth and other agencies versus contained within a region or a particular set of buildings? And so being very rigorous about setting up this governance model, they've been able to build transparency and uh, decisions at the right level within what was otherwise in a very bureaucratic and antiquated structure. Sense of some of what uh, they have been able to accomplish, now all of you are asking how much money did they save? Well, projected to achieve savings of almost $35 million, $35 million a year in the future. That's got to begin to roll up uh, over, over a long number of years because they've got to wait until they're getting out of a lot of long-term leases and that kind of thing. But you can see here on this chart um, what happened in the first uh, fiscal year that the new program was in place. They already saved $2.4 million. They're track to almost double that next year. And as leases come up for renegotiation, you can see here on this chart, they've achieved savings by insourcing repairs and security, renegotiating contracts, um, and looking at preventive maintenance. Obviously, as this begins to move and diffuse across the enterprise, in other words, move from being an edge to being a far more transformative and broad uh, uh, experiment, you're going to see far more savings being realized as they move towards their goal of $35 million a year. This gives you a sense of how an experiment at, at a state focused on something as prosaic as real estate really gives us good evidence about the way in which you can use um, uptake innovations to actually uh, catalyze edge experiments that really move across the enterprise uh, far more quickly. So I think I will turn it over to Antonio, and uh, we can answer questions and wrap up. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tori. 
and uh, innovation there in Massachusetts. So we're going to some Q&A. I think we're going to start first uh, with Kelly Logan. Uh, Kelly, a couple questions coming in around um, how to drive innovation in a public enterprise. Uh, really, are there ways to start small versus starting big with innovations? Uh, how do you couple that um, across like pipe projects? Uh, to get executive sponsorship and move forward that way. So, especially, you know, how are you starting innovation in Pennsylvania uh, and building it up? Uh, fair question. Uh, as I mentioned when I touched on the slide, we the governor actually started our initiative, initiative, started the governor's innovation office in 2011 and launched it with an executive order which outlined um, governance structure that would be put in place, the role of the agencies, the role of the, the central steering committee. Each agency in Pennsylvania has an innovation officer, and that innovation officer in some agencies has many other duties as well, and this is an additional uh, duty. In some of our larger agencies, that is their sole position. They are responsible for, and we have uh, an actual website, for gathering innovation ideas, leading an hoc innovation team within their agency and getting that buy-in within their agency on these good innovations that come through. Um, the significant large-scale innovations come here to the central governing body to vet with our governor's policy office um, and others from the governor's office. And we implement in, in many of those large-scale initiatives, specific cross-agency project teams. Within agencies, however, there are sometimes smaller-scale projects that they can do within their own agency, and they'll start those projects or innovations within their agencies, prove those out, and then as they prove those out and, and it is demonstrated that it works well in the agency, they can be scaled to be enterprise projects where appropriate. So they really do, the ideas come in via several channels, some from within state government, our state employees through those channels I just described, but also on our innovation.pa.gov site, we provide the opportunity for, for anyone in anywhere in the world to submit their recommendations for innovations that we then as a innovation team vet and determine whether or not um, viable or the next steps to making them viable. I don't know if that answered your question, Antonio. No, that's good, but one follow-up to that. So looking at these innovation teams, whether they're at the agency or they're at a, more at the cat level across agencies, are there, are there teams divided into uh, that are looking at more of the incremental innovation versus the big transformations, or is it uh, composed kind of mixed together? There is a, a typical standard team within agency, and that is an ad hoc team. So we make sure that we have executive uh, representation on the team, budget representation on the team, policy representation on the team. So some of those core functions on those ad hoc teams. And when the initiative comes in, if it comes in from an employee in the agency, that is then vetted with that team. Sometimes they're small scale, they can move quickly and they can just get it done. If it is something large scale that is going to be an enterprise cross-agency initiative, we will assign a permanent team to lead that project, and that team then will, will put in place all of the governance around a large-scale project that you would around any large-scale project, which would include project management and all the appropriate um, resources on that. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move next to a question for Nicholas and your experience in New York City. You talked a lot about some of the, the clear outcomes, the better um, uh, the effects coming from some of your work across agencies with analytics, some of the outcomes coming from that. Talk a bit about the idea of, of 
qualitative measures, uh, seeing things around quality of services uh, rel uh, as opposed to just cost improvements, et cetera, um, measurable and that are impacting citizens, so more qualitative measures. Yeah, we're always cognizant of how um, the work we're doing eventually impacts our, our standard measures, mayor's management reports, citywide performance reporting, which are updated frequently. Um, I think one of the most important things that we've seen is how some of those measures, as we get into our projects, how some of those measures are actually reflective of what's going on on the ground. So, so one example I can give you is um, for the illegal conversions. Um, one of the key metrics that the Department of Buildings is responsible for is time to close complaints. So from a, when a complaint comes in to when they're able to get eyes on it and, and close it out, make a determination whether it's a founded situation or whether it's, a, it's, it's not a violation. When we started doing our uh, risk analytic, we were sending them to places and they were not getting in nearly as much, and so that, that metric was actually creeping up. So we've gotten, I think, with picking, um, you know, getting closer to what I think the actual problems are, we're realizing some of the perverse ways that the standard measures are um, are, are measuring what, what the actual problems are. So we absolutely are, um, you know, focused on you know both cost savings and improved service delivery. Um, but the measurements are getting much more nuanced as we understand the data a lot. Better. Better. Okay, thank you. Great answer. Um, again, back to Kelly for a question from for you, from the audience. Can you talk a bit about um, develop measures uh, in regards to your workforce transformation uh, program? Oftentimes, people in government and agencies uh, help developing measures, uh, conceptualizing what the measures could be. Uh, and moving forward with those, can uh, particularly examples like job fairs and diversified communities, or how you uh, integrate HR and affirmative action type of um, goals. Any how you develop measures around that that you can share with us? With re regard to uh, diversity and ensuring that we're focused on that as we move forward, uh, our EO office is involved in those kinds of efforts with developing um, specific measures around that. Um, specifically, when we do workforce development programs or offer our leadership development other, and other um, management development programs, and one of the examples I can use that we most recently uh, launched was our mentoring program. The materials that we send out, we really encourage that as people are nominated for these development programs, we underscore our desire to grow our diversified workforce. And so we as an incumbent on the leaders and managers to work closely with their HR offices to understand that and to make sure that those the folks that they nominated are diverse groups of folks so that we are developing developing that work. Course of the future. But really is um, HR offices working with our EEO offices to assist the leaders and managers as they're doing their workforce planning. So that's part of that dialogue. Uh, probably not setting specific numbers around that, but understanding and sensitizing our folks to that as they identify those to be developed and they towards the future and makeup of their their future planned workforce. And those measures you guys developed and bring them back into your dashboard in a, in a concrete way to track over time? Those you report on those measures and those are available on our website. So our diversity statistics, our um, uh, male uh, population are on our uh, website, yeah. Thank you. Move over to Perry Sapity for a question. Can you talk a bit about how to uh, to the private sector with the public sector in both creations and, and bringing innovations out, and also how uh, what the incentives are for private sector uh, in helping government to innovate? 
So that's a really, really good question, and I'm glad someone asked it because it's um, the interesting time. You know, we just had Election Day a couple of days ago, and I think that looking at what happened, just becoming so abundantly clear that we're at a point in, in the governance of states where we're con we are facing and the impact of an absolutely continuous fiscal crisis. I really, uh, showed you a little bit about the pension liabilities issue and its impact on workforce costs in Pennsylvania. That continuous crisis, no signs of going away. And I think that the state government, in some ways, is one of the least utilized sectors in the American economy. So we have got to figure out new ways to engage the private sector and public in public sector challenges. Um, there has been some experiments in this. You know, um, conventional procurement rules and the conventional way in which states, um, the private sector, approach this, I've really made um, it hard to overcome the typical vendor uh, barrier, barriers that you see. Some ways we've overcome them was, has been through the creative use of um, RFIs, requests for information, or conferences at which they are soliciting innovative ideas, uh, hackathons, and that kind of thing. But I think we're going to begin to see a burgeoning level of sort of next generation opportunities. And Nick talked about this a little bit through old data. We are seeing a private Start organizations actually use open data to develop applications for citizens that are uh, far more responsive to market, narrow market needs than any way in which the uh, state has typically been able to do that. Uh, crowdsourcing, great example in Detroit of using crowdsourcing to go out and assess the condition of hundreds of thousands of blighted properties in less than three months. Absolutely a goal that people thought was impossible for them to complete. Another interesting new innovation in this area I would I would have folks pay attention to is these very things they call pay for success, sometimes called social impact bonds, although they're not real bonds, but ways in which the state is offloading the risk of solving a particular social challenge to the private sector, and they are, in fact, getting paid to do that, but they are sharing the obligation to address it. So I think there's a lot of new experiments going on out there that we all ought to be sharing information about, uh, figure out how we're overcoming the barriers that we see before us. Okay, I think the other, we could probably have a webinar just on that one on that one topic. Okay, um, let's do it. We got it. Uh, I'm going to jump back over to Nicholas. Um, and it's a really broad question, but in New York City, uh, is there a clear link between the way the mayor has developed the strategic plan, uh, goals and objectives, and how you measure performance in the budget, especially driven by analytics, so the, the linkage between analytics and performance, and then how that flows up to the policy level of strategic planning? I think, you know, and, and we are still, uh, at, I would say, the closing closing stage of the early part of the administration, um, and, and I think what's merging really is a layered kind of uh, performance measurement with treating what we've been doing around performance management, inputs, outputs as a baseline, and then layering on top of that how we can measure cross-agency type of uh, initiatives. So, for example, uh, our Vision Zero initiative here in New York, how do we take all the different um, touch points we have onto them and really uh, articulate that from Ten Limousine Commission, Department of Transportation, and why uh, New York Police Department, what all they're all doing to address um, how we conceive of, of uh, traffic fatalities as, as a problem uh, on as a sort of an entity. Um, and then layer on top of that some of these 
larger themes that were really what um, the mayor campaigned on and, and is, is trying to bring to bear around uh, equality in New York and how does something like Vision Zero uh, relate to equality um, and, and these larger sort of uh, control or thematic kind of things and how we move the needle on that, it all starts with this baseline of un making sure government is running properly and that we're me measuring the activity, um, then how to synthesize that into a more complex thing for today's complex problems. Okay. We're going to pose the same question to all three of you guys. Uh, I'm just, Nicholas, I'll start with you being that you're on the line here. Um, we've had a few questions around just some basic ideas on how to get more innovative in organizations, uh, some of the first steps. So here, give us a, you know, maybe a few second answer on what are the steps to develop an innovative culture in, in government and in your organizations. Respond to that question. I would say and solve it and demonstrate that the approach of using data to solve the problem is, is viable. Um, don't overthink it and have to uh, build a new system, do an RFP, you can do it based on the technology that you have at hand. Smart people doing a little research and saying, hey, look at this information. Uh, if you look at it this way, we've done some analysis on it. This is one way you can address your problem. You prove the value of it, and then that really sets the stage for a conversation of how you take that to a larger effort. Okay. Perry, same question to you in your experience looking back in Ohio and Antioch University and with Accenture now, are there some key things that people can do to build an innovative culture in their organization? I think I'd, I'd, um, I'd applaud Nick by saying, you know, data is your friend. If, if you're in trouble getting folks to focus on something you think that you need to bring some innovation to, you know, benchmark the operations and um, broadcast the results about the actual outcomes that are out there. But from a human point of view, I think it's also very important in our organizations to create safe spaces for people to encourage, to encourage our employees uh, to think out of the box and often you know, understand, as actually Honda of America understands, often innovation happens the closest to the customer as possible, those frontline employees that see problems every day. So, Make sure you create some of those safe spaces. Okay. From your vantage point in uh, Pennsylvania, same question to you. I'd like to echo much of what's already been said. I think uh, really it starts from the top. You need the, in our case, governor really leading the effort and driving innovation through the cabinet and through specific governance around it. One of the things that's been most successful for us in exciting our employees is that employee recognition for identifying innovations and actually implementing them. If you go to our, our Facebook page, for example, the, every year the governor has an innovation award ceremony, an innovation expo. In doing that, employees, we, they set up agency booths to talk about their innovations, and then an actual award recognition program where the governor pays out the top awards for the top innovations of the year. That not only excites employees, it generates more ideas that agencies share with one another. So I really can't emphasize enough that recognition of employees thinking of ideas, jumping in and actually executing great ideas and having the governor hand those awards to, to the employee or the agency has handing those awards to the employee. Okay, thank you. We covered a lot of territory today on the webinar. Um, I'm hoping all of you on the line have, have learned a bit on uh, moving forward uptake and edge innovations. We have a lot of work to do around the world on this to make sure that government provides good outcomes for citizens and Right to limit government. Um, please keep in touch in the future. We will be uh, sending out some information soon. Uh, Public Sector for the Future Summit here at Harvard and how you can participate with us on that. Uh, government Innovators Network here at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, sends out regular announcements around innovation and driving transformation in government, so please keep a look at that. I'd like to thank everyone on the line. We had a large uh, turnout which is wonderful, along with, I think, close to 20 different countries on the line, so some wonderful interest from around the world. I'd like to also thank our panelists, Nicholas O'Brien from New York City, Kim 
Hoekman from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and Pierre Abbey from Accenture. And also, of course, I'd like to thank our host of the Government Innovators Network here at the Ashner at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, thank you from me, Antonio Loftoli. It's been wonderful speaking with you today. Uh, good luck in your innovation efforts uh, and uh, live well. All uh, the content we have. Uh, on this webinar will be up on the website, so please feel free to, to access the uh, recording after this uh, webinar is over with, along with report from the June Public Sector Future Summit and, and the PowerPoint presentations from our panel. Thank you, and have a good rest of your day.